Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this evening's guest moderator, Eric Cohn from IndieWire, and tonight's guests, Danny Mulherin and Kate Elliott. Hey, guys. G'day. So I have to say, that trailer doesn't leave a whole lot to the imagination. <laughs> but if someone were to describe this film to me and say it's about cannibals, it's about a home invasion, I wouldn't necessarily assume that it's a comedy. So can you walk us through when you first became aware of this project, because I know it wasn't your original screenplay and, and, and you know what attracted you to sort of that aspect of oh, it. All right. Okay, well first Kiora. Hello. I'm loving New York. It's terrific to be here and instead of the deserted island of New Zealand. It's a three three or four million people screaming, we're lost, come and find us, please get us out of here. So I got out. So thank you for that. Yeah, right. Well well when someone told me I had a movie, Maori Lesbian Cannibals and I laughed. I figured it's got to be a comedy. And uh, it, all horror movies are comic, really. You know, maybe Saw and those sort of torture porn ones. But I think that even the, the zombie movies, all of them have an element of comedy. And in that way, you can sort of go beyond boundaries you ever thought you might not be able to do in a different genre. So horror comedy, you can go to places like we've done, you know, with all the shit we did, like all the limbs being splattered, the lesbianism, the guns, the girls with hot pants and shotguns and whatever. It's fun. And uh, I don't see what's not comic about it. People say it's horrific. It is real. It's based on a true story. So I suppose there is that documentary sort of reality about it. What? <laughs> it's, it's a comic version of what people think New Zealand might be like. So, Kate, is that what, you, what attracted you to this story, or was there a different way in for you? Uh, what attracted me to it was, well, um, I'd never done an action film before either, so uh, with the full you know, fight training and shotgun training and things like that, and the comedy, uh, yeah, that's what attracted me. So you say it's based on a true story. <laughs> oh, that was a joke? No, yeah. That was a joke? But it is based on a... On a it's a screen, an original screenplay that was written by a playwright was written by two Canadian guys, uh, uh, Brad Abrahams and Josh O'Brien, uh, jo and Joseph O'Brien, who are uh, Canadian writers, young Canadian writers. I think Joseph O'Brien's got a film coming out called The Devil's Mile, and then it was went to turn around as these things do, and it was picked up by Dave Gibson, the producer, who gave it to a Maori writer in New Zealand, and and felt it might add another piquancy to the uh, cannibalism, because of course. You know, Maori and many South Pacific nations indulged in cannibalism well into the 18th, maybe uh, middle of the 19th century. And uh, as a ceremonial thing and sometimes as a revenge or utu. And it was... Uh, so it's still, it had a kind of edge about it and he thought that might give it a kind of piquancy for the New Zealand audiences as well. And, and would you say then that it was sort of uh, satiric in a way in terms oh, of how that, those traditions play out in... I think it adds an edge to it, yeah, and definitely satiric. It's sort of... We, compared to a lot of places in the world, New Zealand has reasonably good race relations. There are problems like everywhere, but, you know, uh, Maori and Pakeha, which is what the name is for European New Zealanders, are, are pretty, you know, get on well. And there are economic disadvantages, all that, but... Um, it's got, we've got a pretty mature attitude to race relations, so people laugh a lot. And we get away with things that maybe you couldn't do in, the, in America, you know. It's quite recent his, history, a lot of the stuff in America. So, you know, you can, can't make jokes too much about certain subjects, especially race. Yeah, and we'll take a look at some of those jokes in a little bit with the clips that we have, but uh, one of the things I'm wondering is the tone of the film is so interesting because at first you think you're in sort of this wacky action comedy and then it sort of changes into something else so when you, when you were looking at this film and trying to figure out you know what kind of story you wanted to tell i mean did you have an idea of of you know when you were going to sort of switch things up or, or did, were there surprises along the way there are su definitely surprises uh that's a really good question um and you know a film like this i'd love to know and I'm still trying to work out actually what the heart of it is. It's, and one of the things I wanted to do was make it a satire, but not a, not a, a, a cruel one. It was a comedy, it's a roller coaster ride, it was a pure piece of B grade entertainment. And I don't mean that in any uh, uh, you know, unapologetic way or apologetic way. 
I like that sort of thing. Um, but I did want to make it a satire on middle class aspiration. And that's why we set the Maori family in a very bland McMansion kind of house, you know, which you have, must have vast acres of them in the United States. Huge feng shui nightmares that just go on and on like suburban cemeteries. And I felt there's no one playing on the street, there's no sense of community. And cannibalism to me, you know, we cannibalise our own ourselves in order to get to what we want. All the characters in this film want something beyond what they have. Hemi, Tim Morrison's character, wants to be a famous writer. He's unpublished, he's an associate professor, he's demeaned. His wife wants to run a huge cooking empire. His son wants to impress his dad. The daughter is more afraid of um, admitting she's a lesbian to her parents than finding out that they're cannibals in some ways. It's a satire on suburban life. And the, the, these characters, this dysfunctional family over here, is again a, a form of complete uh, catastrophe. And so, you know, these, these things are kind of things I think about. But I, I didn't want to make a splatter movie in the same way that uh, maybe people expect from a cannibal movie. I wanted the cannibalism to be beautiful. I know that sounds odd, but I thought it could be done like a Nigella Lawson cooking program. Who do you have here? Who are your cooking program people? You know, I want it to look really lovely. You know, make the food look good. And rather than make it a, you know, gnawing and splatter and gore and stuff, it gets there in the end. But I really wanted to think, oh no, this is a good business model and we'll do it well and they've got a really nice way they cut the meat and they don't bruise it and it's done just so. Now, Kate, when we listen to Danny talk about this stuff, it makes it clear that it's a much richer text than one might assume. But as an actor in the work, were you aware of, of how it was trying to go deeper or did you just sort of take it at face value? I took it at face value. <laughs> Guns and... Yeah, I mean, uh, I like the script, but when I origi originally read the script, I saw it at, with far less comedy than what Danny saw it in. I, I saw it as like a horror film, and I was like, fuck yeah, that'd be awesome. But, <laughs> but the comedy adds a whole new dimension to it. So, yeah, no, but I pretty much took it at face value. There are also, um, you know, producerial reasons why the comedy let us... You know, I was under very strict instructions to... Be keep funny. It, <laughs> keep it lighter. They wanted, an, you know, there's ratings. I don't know if you have ratings here. Yeah, R18, we've heard of R16 them. type of thing. R ratings, PG13. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of so this, they wanted it to be, you know, not go over R16 because they wanted younger people to be introduced to this genre, which means you have to kind of colour the gore in a more comic way rather than the more horrific way that another thing might do it. Well, so we have an example elements. of that in a clip here, which is a, an action scene, but also does some other things that are kind of clever. So why don't we take a look at that to give people a flavor of it. So that looks like it was a lot of fun to shoot. Oh, phew. we had two days to shoot that, and it was a lot of work, and uh, it was... It was a lot of fun, especially the gun stuff, which we didn't get to. Oh, yeah, I was waiting. I was like, here it comes. That was the funnest part. She'll get your moment in a bit with the next clip, but we'll talk about that in a second. It was, it was a lot of fun. A lot of planning went into it and uh, a huge amount of, you know, just it's a lot of planning. In fact, that's actually a digital van. I don't know if anyone picked that up, did you? <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was sort of, sort of shot with the elements of CGI in it as well. So that was two days. How long was the whole shoot? Oh, five weeks, I think. So that's 25 days. Most of the work that you've done has been TV, so this must have been a pretty fundamentally different kind of experience just on that level. The difference with TV is basically it's... Who knows the director of... Uh, what's your favourite? Breaking Bad or something like that. Who knows the directors? A terrific programme, but you don't know who they are. And it doesn't mean it's a badly directed thing. They're terrific shows. But film... The thing I've noticed is suddenly the director is right in the spotlight. You know, even if you're a hired hand, you're bang there. And you have to take more responsibility for it. And so the fights become harder. Television is quite pro producerial, really led. And film, I think, the films I want to make anyway, are directorially led. So we had clashes about budget, overtime, second units, all those things. 
because in the end I'm going to be out here taking the kicks or the praise or whatever. And uh, that sort of worked out. So that's the big difference from my point of view. And what about for you, Kate? I know you act in TV projects in, in New Zealand. So uh, do you feel as though this, this kind of a project allows you to do something that that industry sort of limits in a way? Uh, this was a particularly fast shoot. I mean, I made fe- I've made some other feature films before, but this one was particularly fast. So it was, for me, almost like shooting television for the big screen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, it was fast. <laughs> you know, we, we, we were, and plus it was action stuff, so you had to be on ball and on point all the time, you know? Well, what about just, I mean, it's, it can be a sensitive subject, but people talk about it a lot in this country, which is that the ro- roles for women are generally not as prominent as they should be. There, you, you usually see a lot of male-driven projects, male star system is, is yes. basically dominant. Do you feel like you have to deal with that kind of thing as well? Yeah, all the time. I mean, I get the best roles in New Zealand, I think, yeah. and I get all of them, so I'm okay, but everybody <laughs> else is fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Well, why don't we give people a a good example of of what it's like to take on this kind of of role that that really challenges perceptions. Do you want to set up the clip that we're about to play? Uh, Yeah, I mean, what do you mean? No, what do you mean? A little bit of context before Uh, they uh, see what they see. So this scene, what comes before this? It's the scene where... Oh, so she's been... been, I had a fight with a cop. Cops come into the house. I've had a fight with a cop. I've been sprayed in the face with pepper spray and um, Rena, who I fall in love with and who falls in love with me throws a glass of milk over my face and then, is it, I don't know where it goes from yeah that, that, that's, that's good let's, let's roll the clip <laughs> I'm guessing that one didn't take quite as long as two days for the, the last one we've got some milk here we're going to reenact that weren't we no. <laughs> every day yeah Maybe, anyway, maybe yeah. at the Q and A after the screening. <laughs> no, we yeah. talk intellectually about that. <laughs> it's terrific. It's well, it's funny. My process was <laughs> pasteurized or hob- homogenized. Oh, homogenized. Uh, all this. What what sort of milk was it? <laughs> I don't know. It's actually coconut milk. Yeah. Because the normal milk didn't look like milk. You know, the stupid. It was the really weird. Stuff. The normal milk didn't look white enough. That doesn't look like milk either. It looks like cream, Denny. It was coconut cream. Yeah, it was. It was coconut cream. Well, you know, what the hell? It's better for you. It was. <laughs> I was very well moisturized. <laughs> I was My say, skin how, how looks many, how amazing. Many takes, how many takes for the splatter shot? Uh, we did a lot of it in, on um, second unit as well. Yeah. All of the close-up stuff. I did, I did the fights and mm. um, second unit did some of the sort of pouring stuff. <laughs> pouring You know, stuff. the pawning, Took pouring. Took hours. No, yeah, right. the, you know... The teenagers did that bit, and uh, I did the action stuff and the major drama. Yeah. So there, there's so much graphic stuff in this movie, it's kind of amazing. You can make a laundry list and then just sort of pick it apart. It, was there ever a point in time where people wondered if you might be going too far, or was that never I, a question? Listen, I wish we'd gone further. <laughs> um, oh no, I really do. I don't think there's any reason not to in a low-budget exploitation flick like this. Um, and... Uh, that's the battle you always have. I would have loved to, and I'm sure there'll be people of this genre who wanted me to go further. And you'll see... But, you know, that's one of the restrictions you have as a filmmaker. And, you know, for some people it goes too far. So you can never please everyone. But hopefully I'll please no one one day. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. When I was watching this film, I thought a lot about early Peter Jackson... I know that you've worked with him in the past. You were in Meet the Feebles, for example, and I uh, was wondering if he was a specific influence on you as a, as a filmmaker as well. Well, Meet the Feebles, yeah, that's a sort of influence on this, and I, in a way, that's another laundry list. That was anarchy, though. That was, we wrote a script for the film commission that was completely different to the one we shot. It was comp- we were mad in those days and we shot in secret basically and we just tried to make it as obscene as we could and it is I don't know if any of you are familiar with Meet the Feebles none of you well you got a treat in store it's a puppet splatter movie basically it's the Muppets but with blood and gore if you look at Peter Jackson's Academy Award acceptance speech when Lord of the Rings won I think he he said the Academy missed out on that one yeah yeah I, I won an award for best female performance I played a a pink hippopotamus with a machine gun. 
and, uh, and that was terrific. Uh, you know, so one of my most uh, deeper roles, I thought a lot about that. Um, and, uh, yeah, but, yeah, he, of course he had an influence, you know, and uh, after that I went and worked in Hollywood for a couple of years. Wasted time, really. But I, le- I, I hung around with a lot of horror writers and we worked on Nightmare on Elm Street and a thing called Only Puppets Bleed, which never got made, unfortunately. Great title. Uh, yeah, it was a terrific idea. Oh, tragic story, but another time. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to do a real documentary, realistic uh, CSI, not, not as hammy as that, but program with, with frogs and ducks and shit. And so you'd have an opening scene of a, you know, a thing getting shot and there's blankets and barrels and documentary style and you come in the, this you know, dog who's a cop and his partner who's a duck who's been shot. You know, and I thought, let's play it serious, man. Absolutely no, no laugh track, just real serious. And we can go places and have, talk about all sorts of issues without having to um, apologise for it. Like you could talk about crack addiction. Ab- this is in the late 80s, 90s. Abortion, crack addiction, race relations, all sorts of stuff. But because they're frogs, tadpoles, half-eaten chickens, whatever, we could do it. But they wanted jokes like the Flintstone sort of jokes, you know, that drew attention to their puppetness. I always imagine Kate in this role, by the way. Honestly, why you why you sneer? I'm not sneering. That's my smile. <laughs> oh, right. Um, I really loved Kate for this, and me and Simon Bournefield, you know, Sly. Yeah. And we, when we read it, he said we've got to get Kate for this. And when she auditioned, she we we really just knew there was never any doubt about Kate being in it. Who who's got this kind of look at her. She's got this really unusual, feral, <laughs> vampirella. <laughs> she, look at those eyes. She's beautiful and, and, uh, and a great actress too. She just came from doing very twee costume capers about Catherine Yeah, Mansfield. I had never done anything like this. But I'd been boxing for a year, so that was kind of lucky. So I was kind of like fit and I could hit well and, you know. And in fact, we should open it up. Is it we gone on too long? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if we have yeah. questions from the audience. Sure, please. we've got one for you right here to the right in the third row. Where? Who? Hi. It's, it's oh. not, a, sorry, it's not a question, but a comment. Um, it sort of, I mean, just the trailers um, on the clips remind me of, um, uh, like, Tarantino and um, Rodriguez, um, I think yeah, it was the, yeah. the Grindhouse, mo- Grindhouse movie. It is a Grindhouse yeah. movie, yeah. yeah and, and it's great. I know that's a compliment. Oh, it is. No, thanks. I've copied Tarantino and Rodriguez. Thanks a lot. That's a compliment. <laughs> yeah, no, it is a compliment. <laughs> um, but I, listen, I was, t- you know, the Feebles was way before them guys. And so this stuff has been around for a while. And though Tarantino's, this is sort of Tarantino light, really. Um, it's not as quite as much blood and guts as Django or and you know they're R18 again I don't know what are they here rated you know usually R R what does R mean nobody under 17 under 17 okay so uh, you know there was was that element to it but yes thank you I'll take that Rodriguez and they're wonderful filmmakers brilliant I would say that you're less of a you pay less homage to other films, so you know. The no, I don't. I, yeah, homage, you know, sounds like yogurt to me. I'm not uh. tribute. <laughs> I know, I know. Jesus, Eric. Jesus. Just trying to make sure there's no <laughs> cultural disconnect. Here, well, yeah, right? cultural disconnect is one of the things I love most about the world. Okay, anything for Kate? Any other questions? Don't be shy. I won't make a fool of you. Much. We've got one in the middle, bro. Oh, hey, lady. Yeah, great. <laughs> I'm curious as to how you get this movie started. How do you walk into a room and pitch this and say, we want to do a movie about cannibalism, but stay with me, it's funny. How do you get the ball rolling on a film <laughs> like this? You already got me laughing. I think that's a good pitch. You've done it. Yeah. We've got to, listen, okay, three words. Lesbian, cannibals, Maoris. You know, see, you laughed. You've got to trust your own laughter a laugh is worth a million bucks. And uh, if you can make them laugh, you've got them. And so to people who worry about the pitch and making it logical and stuff, it's a bit like that old Jewish proverb, you know, a million bucks is only money, but friendship is business. And that's kind of what you do, connect. So never feel, if you want to tell them, you tell them. Lesbians, cannibals, Maoris, 
You make up the rest, baby. <laughs> Any other questions? We've got time for about two more. Go ahead. Raise your hand. I'll come on over. Oh, oh here we go. There we go. All the way on the end of the second row. On my way. Hi. Thank you so much to the two of you um, for this. Um, what kind of works will you be getting into in the future? And I'm sorry if you already have answered this. Um, uh, no, uh, what to what, what the kind of works uh, would you describe some of the works that you'll be getting into in the future? Getting into in the future? Mm -hmm. What's next? Or prospects? Or well, I just moved back to Hollywood, unfortunately. <laughs> I'll be going back to Hollywood and I'll be auditioning and feeling sad about it. Yeah. <laughs> what are the you doing, Danny? The good thing about New Zealand is you can work there. I'm trying to develop some integrity because coming to this festival, I've seen so many movies which are, are beautiful. I mean, Bending Steel and Inside Outside have so much integrity. And to quote a great New York movie, Sweet Smell of Success, integrity gives me indigestion. <laughs> and I wish I had it. I'm going to try and have more. But what I'm doing next apart from trying to have some moral character, is a musical about cancer. See, you laughed, it's a good pitch. And then I'm doing a, another thing about cancer, a play written by a guy called Gavin McGibbon, uh, who's about three con artists who uh, <laughs> steal a heist movie, but they steal from a teen cancer charity, which is outrageous. And I thought, how's he going to get away with this? So it's shocking, but I'm interested in those areas. If you're not going to astonish people, forget it. But the project I'm most keen on, which I'm going to stay in New York and write, um, is a, a thing called Smithy, based on an old Frederick Durand-Matt story. None of you all know him, maybe, hopefully, about a, a gangster who, in a fit of wild rebellion, turns everything he believes in upside down without even knowing it. And that's what I'm really keen on doing. I've got the opportunity to, and the confidence to go for it. So that's the American dream, isn't it? Something like that? <laughs> so I'm going to follow that while I'm here at least. So thank you. Good question. Thank you. We've got another question for you in the back row. And I know I said two more, but I see one in the middle as well. We'll get to everybody. So we'll do here, then the middle, and we'll wrap it up. OK. Hello, you had said you did the shoot in 25 days. Uh, what were your working hours? Working hours were 10 and 3 quarter hours a day, plus overtime sometimes. Um, but it was pretty full on. You must have had really long. Uh, yeah. Makeup would have been, what, 5.30? Yeah. And, and you would have got home at, what, 10? 9, nine, nine? 10, yeah. It was We worked really on. hard. And it's quick, you know. We're, we're shooting a lot of footage in a uh, you day. You know, I had huge fights, man. I almost resigned halfway through this movie. <laughs> what? I did. <laughs> did you? I threatened to walk off. Because I had a seven minute... <laughs> yeah, after, after working with Kate and it got to take number four, I said, I don't do yeah. four <laughs> takes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it wasn't like that. I, I almost walked off because I was, I was just getting behind. And we didn't have a second unit at that stage. So I more or less said, I'm not going on and we negotiated and we got a second unit, which really helped, because all those stupid shots of milk going down hot pants, not stupid, but necessary, or knives going into bodies or things like that, which take hours, I didn't need to do. And I could just get on with the storytelling and leave it to second unit to light and do those. And that made my life a million times easier, and the producer, Dave, agreed with me, because it was just impossible. I got six or seven minute days, and I don't know if anyone's done film before, but that's a lot. You know, usually a film should be around two or three minutes a day, especially action. We've got your last question for you right here in the middle row. Oh, baby, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good. Excellent. Um, my question has more to do with just you guys on set, and it's specifically directed to Kate, but... Um, or both of you, actually. Compared to other shoots that you guys have done, what was the feeling on set? You guys have a hilarious banter. <laughs> and so what was yeah, the it was, feeling it on was set? It was pretty mad. Like, uh, you know, the, uh, often when you work on set, you, the, the 
it, refle it reflects what's going on on screen. So, um, but I mean, like lots of the lots of the other actors, apart from Tim, were very new actors. Had uh, never done anything before, or had um, or Danny had found them at a bar one night or something like that. <laughs> it's no, true. That, true one story. One of them was a wine waiter. I think. One of them was a wine waiter, <laughs> and um, so so yeah, like it was like. It was a lot of fun. It <laughs> Say it with a bit of bloody Jesus. No, it was. It was. Well, it, it was, was you know. yeah. It was great fun. <laughs> it was. I loved it. And one of the things I, I love working with, I love actors. I was an actor for a while. I didn't like looking at myself because I'm too fat and ugly. And uh, I'm, I really enjoy directing. And I, I really want to create an atmosphere where people enjoy being on set because that's when they do their best work. I hate... As an actor, I hated directors who screamed and yelled and made you feel frightened. I really yeah, I would agree. Yeah. And <laughs> was I like that? What? I wasn't like no, that. You weren't like that at all. You were being, I would be like, oh, I feel like I'm being objectified. And you'd be like, shh, turn around and show me your ass. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you are. That's why you're here. <laughs> well, you've got to be honest, but I, the only... The only reason you can get away with these things, the only charm I have, which is not a lot, is that I can tend to tell, say what I really think without me, people hating me. And, and that's been a boon. So my whole thing was making people, and as a comedian as well when I did that, I used to go on with a little cup of tea, which was my cup of tea I had at home, and used to try and imagine I was with people who I loved. That You know when you go to a dinner party, if you've ever been to a dinner party, I don't know, whatever, but, uh, and you're, you've got friends you shine with, who you're funny with and who laugh at your jokes, and that's what you've got to believe. The character acting is fucking easy. All that shit is easy. The big act is to pretend that you love you and you love the people around you for whatever moments you're working. And if I can create that spirit, then I'm winning because these people here who put their reputations and their asses on the line... Literally the bikini line, uh, <laughs> are, are the ones who need to feel good about themselves. And if they don't, if they're scared, they're going to fucking suffer. I, I've seen too many of this sort of type of director who scream at people, and I just do not like that. And I would never do it. I don't do any of that manipulative shit of trying to make them cry or any shit like that. Because I know how stupid it is. Easy to cry. Trust try not to, you know. And uh, so it was just... That's why I got into directing, because I hated directors so much. And on anyway. that uplifting note, Let thanks, me everybody. thank our panel for being here again. Thank you thank guys you so much. Guys. Thank you, guys. And thank you for being a great audience. Come to the movie.